In medieval China, between 618 and 907 CE, the Tang Dynasty reigned. It was a golden age in Chinese history, known for its social, cultural, and economic prosperity. Changyang, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, was the epitome of that age. It was the most populated city in the world, with more than 3 million inhabitants. This is due to the city being positioned at the end of the Silk Road, making it extremely wealthy from all the merchants that passed through its walls. For generations, Changyang was a deposit of great wealth, but also strife, as many warlords, families, and politicians cutthroat each other over the dynasty, which ultimately would lead to the end of China's most glorious of ages. Okay, so why did I provide this miniature lecture? See, when I was perusing the internet in search of historical genres, I found allurement to the anime called GYG Shanglang, or Memory of Changyang. In case the name hasn't hinted at it, this is a Chinese anime, the first I've seen from that part of the world. Anime that surprisingly has been thoroughly viewed by those within the community. First I would say because of how small its availability is, either being found on Amazon, streaming services that are only for the Chinese demographic, or like trying to get the hook up from uh, down under so I say. For that's why I make this video, to bring light to this obscure show to a global community, discussing its origins, plot, and ultimately, what are my thoughts on it. Like many other animes, it originated as a manga series that lasted from 2016 to February of this year. Originally titled Prince Don't Do This, written by the mysterious Dong Man Tang. It got published to Tencent Animations and Comics, a subsidiary of the Chinese multinational conglomerate of Tencent. Eight months later, Billy Billy, China's biggest streaming service, turned it into a show that lasted for two seasons. The first airing on October 28, 2020 to January 6 of this year, and the second airing from April 15th to July 1st, 2021. Now then, lend me your attention to the overall story of the show before we advance into my opinions. In the first episode, our protagonist, Emila, is a princess from the rural lands of Zhiyu. As a quick easter egg, in the original publication of the manga, the princess was described as an ethnic Uyghur, in nationality located in western China. This was later censored by Tencent, turning her into a princess from the Moon Tide Kingdoms. Most likely to cover up the <clears throat> <coughs> But, moving on. Emila is escorted to the major city of Changyang as part of a diplomatic mission to bring lasting peace between their kingdoms by marrying the ninth prince of the Tang Dynasty, Chang Li. But her assembly gets ambushed by bandits who tried to kidnap her when it seems all is lost, our lady is saved by none other than her husband-to-be, Chang Li, who personally takes this all as just, meh. From there the story takes off. Emila, now renamed Mian Ye, is married to Chang, and peace is now assured, right? Well, politically yes. She understands her mission is to bring peace between the kingdoms, but can't help but feel irritated by her husband's cold behavior, a stark contrast from her very positive, energetic, and lively demeanor. So she makes the most of Chang Yong, perusing its markets and making new friends. Chang Li, on the other hand, doesn't see much in her, as he thinks this all is just politically advantageous. But they do have their moments of chemistry when they are trying to coexist. I'll speak on that in a moment. Meanwhile, there are looming threats to end their marriage, that's vaguely focused on them being a political obstacle, giving us a glimpse into the political theater Chang Yong's embroiled with its wars, rebellions, potential rivals, and the investigative pursuits of our lead characters into who's behind all the framing, the gossip, and the assassinations. That's the overall plot of this show, Chang and Mian Ye trying to coexist, and the shadowy forces seeking their demise. And with how the second season ended on a lot of cliffhangers, I wouldn't be surprised when they release their third season in the future. According to the scores of Billy Billy, Amazon, and My Anime List, both seasons do have a decent score worthy of an audience. But there are rooms for improvement. The obvious, I would say, would be the sudden ends of each episode without hinting at its conclusion, especially with the last episode of season one. It just didn't feel like an ending to a show. So when it ended, I was left with, w wait, that's the end? But from the view of Devil's Advocate, I would say it was a motivation for me to see what happens next. 
but I felt like there should have been a resolving conclusion to each episode to avoid confusion. One nitpick I saw was the sudden scars Cheng Li had in the last episode of Season 2, and then the pristine body he had in Episode 2, Season 1. Like, where did those scars start appearing? How did they miraculously appear? How'd you do that? To me, the first episode felt out of place. Now, I know, I know that sex and violence sells, it's a pleasure of mine as well, but here it just felt unnecessary. Let me explain. In the manga, it starts off when Emla is entered safely into Chengyang to eventually wait her husband-to-be, while Liang Xiying, who plays a lead role in episode 1, is dealing with conspirators. But in the show, with there being an action scene and Chang Li saving Emla, makes the action scene seem like filler, when you could have achieved the same result from what the manga did. What I think will be cool is, instead, how about a narration of the setting of what Chengyang and China at large is like at that time? Information that I wish I had prior to watching the show, it would make for a rich lore to back it up. One last critique that I think is most important is I wish there was better context to the characters' relationships and inclinations. Chang Li's father, for instance, who, after committed something of which I don't wish to spoil in episode 8 of season 2, leaves me befuddled on how Chang Li can still look at him in the face, or even live in the same city. It doesn't even get mentioned by Chang Li in the present, making the scene seem like filler. To make matters more confusing, there are moments where when we get new characters, there's no context to how they know each other, leaving me more confused and intrigued. Even after this video, I'm still trying to figure out how I can best understand the relationships each character has with each other, a task that can turn anyone into a conspiracy nut job, and unfortunately can leave the audience scratching their heads at the end of the day. With my opinions on the sudden endings, the first episode, and the need for context, what can I say was good about the show? If anything attracted me more to this show, it has to be the art. I had to put my hat down to them because they did a beautiful job portraying this romanticist perception. The architecture, how they dress, the interiors, even the Chinese depictions on the folding screens shows how much care they put into it. The second through to the fourth episode stand out dramatically to me, as it was so captivating by how they dressed during the royal marriage, including the customary traditions they performed. Altogether, well done on presenting your art to the public. Romance is a tricky genre, because you're dealing with emotions, love in that case, that can't be formulated into a science. What I'm saying if this sounds too metaphysical is that I could appreciate the chemistry between Mian Ye and Cheng Li throughout the show. Though, as an evolved 21st century man, arranged marriages make me recoil, I can't help but admire their evolution. Cheng Li especially, from once being emotionless, seeing her as a political tool, to gradually expressing authentic feelings of love and affection. It's your average run-of-the-mill romance story. Not turbulent like Domestic Girlfriend, nor is it toxic like Rent a Girlfriend, just like Goldilocks, just right. Speaking of emotions, Season 2 has to be my personal favorite of the two. Because not only did they attract me visually, but emotionally. It gave like this whirlwind of feelings of love, lost, hope, betrayal, wonder, suspicion, that makes you latch onto the characters on an emotional level. I almost got choked up on one scene, I'm not gonna lie. Spoiler coming up, if you're not interested, go to this part of the video. Good? Alright. Despite how I bash on the complicated vagueness of the villains, I think they did a good job on betraying Mian Ye's lifelong friend, Yin Se, who came to Cheng Yang to win her over because he genuinely loves her. But when Mian Ye confessed her true loyalty, it provoked a burning envy in Yin Se, that would lead him into attempt on killing Chang Li. This consequently lost Minya's affection to him, turning his love into a selfish obsession. Of all the villains in the series, Yin Se was my personal favorite, because it makes sense to why he's like this, which makes you have an attachment to him, unlike the other ones, I may add, who came from nowhere with little context to their inclinations. And now, what can I say about Memory of Cheng Yang is that it was a worthwhile experience. Though it does have its flaws of lacking context between the settings and some of the characters, that didn't stop me from turning away from it. The art is its cornerstone, and they hooked me at the end of the series to look forward to what's next. And, I would say in a grander scheme, it encouraged me to check out other relatable content from that part of the world. All I can say is take the chance to watch it if you're interested. 
What do you think was good about the show? What are its pros and cons? And what did you catch that I didn't? A piece of art that I think deserves conversation. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.